<clears throat> Back in 2006, I visited one of my favorite places in the world, the glacier in Zermatt of Switzerland, where I spent a lot of my youth training for the Olympics. But this time, I was back there together with my two boys. I really wanted to show them what had been my second home for very many years. We did ski, we had fun, but the glacier had moved many meters back. And the lift that I used to take when I was skiing there in the summer was not longer working. The ice was melted and the snow was gone. This summer, we went back, but we could not enter the village because of a flood. There were broken ro roads and railway tracks. The village was isolated. This was a wake-up call. Back in 2006, the melted ice and the closed ski lift was not connected to the climate change in my son's mind. No, they suddenly were. And this was a stark reminder for all of us that we are all bound to this common threat. But the solutions require action, courage, and cooperation at a global scale. And that is a challenge. We need to speed up and scale up solutions to reach our global goal or get to net zero by 2050. To save this beautiful planet as we all know it today. We need action, not just pledges. 40% of the 2,000 largest companies in the world have pledged that they will reach net zero. But 40% is a lot. But how many has agreed and are on track? Only 23%. And that counts for Europe that is leading on this agenda. That is like aiming for a gold medal in the Olympics not doing any training, not having a workout plan. You won't even qualify and make it to the start. But unlike the Olympics, this is about our future on the planet. We need to act and dare to put our energy where we can have a positive impact. We need to focus on turning the global challenge into a solution. This mindset, Turning challenges into solution was something that I experienced when I was a young girl. Because my mother, she was an expert of directing my abundance of energy the right way. I actually ran 10 times around the house before we had dinner. Or I was running to the store to get everything that she had forgotten or any of our neighbors. So she turned my energy into a solution, and then I was not a problem. I was lucky in my teenage years to also experience this mindset of turning challenges into solution. By the time I got to high school, I was sure I was going to be an athlete. And I really liked academics as well, uh, but it was so hard to do both. The principal at my high school, he came over to me one day and invited me to his office. And he said, Stina, are you really that interested in your sport that you're willing to throw away your future and your studies? And my answer was, yes. And he said, OK, I give you an offer. If you are above average grade at school, you can be away for as much training and competition that you want. That year, I was not at school one single day between Christmas and Easter. But we made an agreement, and we both fulfilled the agreement. But switching one's mind is not just something you can do at an individual level. Some years back, I was working with a mid-sized engineering company that dared to switch their mind regarding their technology. They switched from oil and gas to sustainable farming. They won an innovation prize, and they got honored by the Queen of Norway. Another example is a ferry company that dared to put out really big, hairy goals on reduction of emission. They have struggled, 
They have failed many times, but they are also succeeded. And now they're actually leading on a technology revolution within their industry, together with partners. So they're forging the path for others to follow. If we want to make this world more sustainable, we also need to go beyond climate charity and philanthropy. We must support the people, the government and the businesses that are able to solve those challenges that the world really need solving. We need to then switch our mindset and find solutions that are both environmentally friendly and financially sustainable at the same time. That starts looking for opportunities. And to find them, we must dare to fail. And common for the two companies that I described for you is their lack of fear of failing. And I can tell you, to dare to fail, it is like a superpower. It liberates you, whether you are a company or a person, and it actually liberated me to turn defeat into gold. Back in 1993, I lost the gold medal in the Olympics. And it might sound strange to see you lose a gold medal, but when you are capable of winning a gold in Olympics, it is definitely a failure to become third. I was the best trained, I had the best technique, I had come back from a serious injury, but I didn't dare to go at full speed and jump as high as I needed. Was it the fear that kept me back? Was it the fear of failing that kept me back? I went home. And what I did was putting up post-its all around my apartment. For continuing skiing, against continuing skiing. I got the most of the four skiing, so I went all in for the Olympics in 1994. So the next thing I did was to make myself a list, a list of my fears. So on the top of the list was diving backwards into the water, flying a paraglider, jumping in a parachute, and so it went on. And I actually started doing it all. So imagine me there in diving training with kids from six to eight years, and um, there I was, an Olympi Olympic athlete with bruises from here to here. I don't know if you tried it, but the water hits you really hard. I tried to ski faster, skied out in races and crashed. I pushed my limits. So when I was at the start of the Olympics in 1994, I told myself, I don't have any fear. I have faced my fears. I'm not afraid of failing. And I won. And the very next day, I started on my academics, thanks to my principal back at high school. That was possible. I am just one out of very many medalists from Norway. Little Norway with only 5.5 million people have so many great, great athletes. And I believe the reason why is that we collaborate cross sports and cross disciplines. I was lucky. I was training with the men and female alpine skiers, skaters and more. And I shared my innovative training regime with my hardest competitors. Sounds strange? Yes. But the way we then partnered up as a group, it allowed us to speed up and scale up our achievements. Similarly, I believe that the hard thing to abate this climate challenge, we need to collaborate more and we need to uh, work across sectors, industries and national borders. We need partnership and collaboration. And sharing is daring. So what is your personal role 
or my personal role in getting to net zero by 2050? Is it only up to the governments and the multinationals? In business, it often starts in the boardroom with large decisions. So why not have a board meeting with yourself? When did you last have a board meeting with yourself? And what was on your agenda? For your next board meeting, I hope you have one, I can suggest this agenda. My three lessons are like this. Put it on your agenda. Firstly, don't waste your energy. Direct it towards where you can make a positive impact and contribute to a change. Secondly, don't fear failure. It's like an important stepping stone for success. And thirdly, seek solutions. If you do not see them, at first, switch your mindset, invite others in, and the answer will emerge. Change and transformation is always really hard. To change a strategy and direction is filled with uncertainty. But whatever you decided on in your personal board meeting or in your corporate board meeting, know that progress requires commitment and consistency, especially when it comes to sustainability. It is like training again. You train really hard. You seek new solutions, you invest in lo a lot in your training, but you stand still for this for a long, long time. But then you get to the next level and achieve very much better results. I've seen this in my personal training, my professional life with businesses, but sustainability is hard for everyone. And especially because we might not ever see the result of our hard work. But hopefully, our children will. Thank you. <laughs>